What's up, high intensity healthers? Today, we're gonna to talk all about the endocannabinoid system. We're gonna talk about CBD, THC, and various endocannabinoid, synthetic cannabinoid receptors, and how you have an endogenous endocannabinoid system. Researchers actually dub this the endocannabinoid ohm because it's this complex metabolome. When the cannabinoid receptors, most namely CB1 and CB2, are stimulated, they initiate a litany of downstream metabolic processes that affect both appetite, satiety, mood, anxiety, epilepsy, seizures. They even affect things like adiposity. They even affect metabolism, AMPK. This endocannabinoid system is really elaborate. So I wanna welcome you back to High Intensity Health. I'm Mike Mutzel. I'm super excited and honored that you were here. If at any point you're like, dude, th these videos are cool, please subscribe, hit that like button, and I love your comments because I learn from you just like you learn hopefully from these videos. So if you have a question, comment about CBD, THC, the endocannabinoid system, please leave it below. So why in the heck are we talking about this? Well, number one, I have been supplementing with phytocannabinoids for a while. I like Ned's product. They are a show sponsor. They are not paying me to make this video at all. I just wanted to learn more about this complex system that I've known about for a while. And I wanna just give you a little shout out. I have a book here called Belly Fat Effect. When I was studying for that book, writing that book back in 2009 to 2013. I came across this researcher, Patrice Canny, and he's a, I think he's in Brussels in Belgium, but I know he does some work outside of London at King's College. And he published a, a few papers about the endogenous endocannabinoid system and how dysbiotic gut bacteria can uh, crosstalk with the endocannabinoid system in fat cells, what scientists dub as adipocytes, and how there's altered CB1 signaling within the fat cells as a, a consequence of perturbed gut bacteria. So I've been kind of remotely interested almost for about 10 years now at just kind of following loosely the endocannabinoid research and the endocannabinoid system. I think it's pretty fascinating. Fast forward to 2019. Then my dog very recently got really ill. She appeared to be in pain, had labored breathing. She appeared to have like some upper respiratory stuff going on. And so I started supplementing, you know, giving her phytocannabinoids from Ned and her health started to improve. And I was like, this is crazy. What's going on? What's going on with their immune system? I was just hoping to get a little bit of pain relief, maybe help her sleep better, maybe increase her appetite because she was not eating anything. So I started to dive into the research and this is where things got really, really fascinating for me because I love molecular biology and I assume because you're still watching this video that you do too. So let's now with that as a preface, let's talk about this and let me just pause. I tried to film a video with my dog Shasta and I started crying. I'm gonna try and keep it together during this video. Uh, but basically, um, basically my dog is dying and I did a bunch of research um, around cannabinoids to just see like how I could help her um, at, the, at these final stages. It was really emotional for me because I was, you know, telling you all the things that I've learned or I was trying to articulate to you all these things that I've learned about the endocannabinoid system and CB1 receptors and the anandamide and all this and I was crying. So here we are with part two. Hopefully it's a little bit more polished. So here's a few, three things you need to know. Okay. You have two different primary endocannabinoid receptors in your body. These are endogenous receptors, friends. Even if you don't supplement with any phytocannabinoid, if you never touch THC or cannabis, it doesn't matter. You still have these receptors, which is really fascinating. So you have the CB1 receptor and the CB2 receptor. Let's talk about the CB2 receptor first because I think this is very important. It's newly identified and we now know that when we take endogenous phytocannabinoids and things like that, that we stimulate this CB2 receptor, it's found and it's ubiquitously expressed in our immune system. This is where we might get some anti-proliferative and maybe even cancer uh, supportive benefits from supplementing or taking or at least finding, uh, fine tuning the endocannabinoid system tone by way of stimulating the CB2 receptor in our immune system. Now, now let me pause here. I don't wanna make any egregious claims. I was sitting in an airport at an airport recently and overheard people talking about how they cure cancer by taking CBD. I'm not going to say that or make that claim at all, but there is some interesting research showing that individuals with cancer may benefit from taking 
CBD potentially because it may stimulate or affect this receptor and therefore make our immune system more resilient. Okay, so I'm just, just going to leave it at that, but very interesting. Now here's where things get a little bit more fascinating. Uh, behind me, the CB1 receptor, I'll throw some things on the screen here. This is ubiquitously expressed in the brain. So in the cerebellum and basal ganglia. And this is why in different disease states such as epilepsy and Parkinson's, there is some interesting research being done and conducted about the utility of stimulating the CB1 receptor because in those different disease states, the cerebellum and basal ganglia is implicated in the etiology of the disease. Even in Alzheimer's, what we see is a compensatory increase in the CB1 receptor as a means to potentially modulate or re, you know, balance uh, abnormal brain chemistry in Alzheimer's, okay? So this is what's kind of interesting, and I wanna pause on the brain conversation and go back to obesity for just a moment. What we see in obesity, and the animal model studies have shown this, is there is an increase in the CB1 receptor density in fat cells. Now we know in individuals, when they gain weight, when they, when they transition from lean to overweight to obese, there is a, there's a, a, a linear increase in the amount of inflammation that they have in their adipocytes. So it's not yet known if the increase in the receptor density of the CB1 receptor in fat cells is a cause or a compensatory shift once you know there's a lot of inflammation within and among the fat cells in individuals that are overweight. So data is still pending. We don't really know exactly what's the chicken or the egg here. But scientists have figured out that in the context of Alzheimer's, that this increased CB1 receptor throughout different parts of the brain may be a compensatory means to reduce inflammation in the brain, okay? Now, other tissues and, and brain regions that you may be of importance you know, the, to this conversation and context is the hippocampus and the amygdala. The hippocampus, which is Greek for seahorse, it's a part of the brain where we form a lot of memories. It's also a part of the brain that's very susceptible to stress-induced memory changes. You know, you people that are very stressed out, there's a lot of cortisol. Um, that can affect the hippocampus. And the amygdala is where we have a lot of emotional responses that are stored and initiated there. So a lot of people that are abused, that have been raped or, or physically abused or you know mentally abused or they're very uh, flighty have been in bad situations uh, and then get a really you know like a panic or a stress response that can be a hyperactive amygdala and this is why I say people you know for, and I've experienced the benefits uh, from a psychological standpoint taking you know phytocannabinoids taking CBD oil and I've noticed that it calms the mood it has a natural anxiolytic effect that's because of probably this one two punch with this this high concentration of CB1 receptors within the hippocampus and the amygdala, okay? So anxiety, sleep, things like that, you know, and we talked about the cerebellum and basal ganglia with movement, epilepsy, seizures, uh, even multiple sclerosis. There's a lot of research being conducted on using cannabinoids because of the high concentration of the cannabinoid receptors in those brain regions. Now, here's where things get really interesting, again, going back to anxiety, is in the cortex, in the prefrontal cortex, there's a, a high concentration of the cannabinoid receptors, and that may have to do with, again, mood, again, feelings of anxiety, things like that. So if we're constantly worried, if we're thinking and judging and you know, adding a lot of um, you know, preconceived notions about who we are as people, things like that, that are developed in the cortex, that can affect mood and cre can create anxiety. And so this is where perhaps supplementing with endocannabinoids, whether it's derived from hemp or derived from cannabis, uh, can be helpful. Here's what's really fascinating that I did not know, and I think you might find this particularly interesting, is when you take cannabis or cannabinoids or say a phytocannabinoid or something from THC along those lines, uh, CBD, cannabidiol is what CBD stands for, doesn't directly stimulate the CB1 receptor. What it does is it prevents or increases the, the, the amount of time that an, your own endogenous endocannabinoid called anandamide is present which is crazy. So again, we think that cannabidiol or CBD would stimulate this receptor, but what it does is it actually increases the half-life, so to speak, or the, the, the amount of available anandamide, which I think is fascinating. So for now, that's what I've learned about the different receptors, different receptor types. You know, it's a complex, intricate system. Uh, what I can tell you in closing is pharmaceutical companies are investing a lot of money into, you know, various synthetic agonist or CB1 or CB2 receptor antagonist, depending upon the tissue specificity. So it's a really fascinating conversation, fascinating narrative. There is some, some gender differences here where women tend to have 
a, a, a higher prevalence of polymorphisms involved in the CB1 receptor and distribution. So this is gonna be just kind of an, an overview exploratory video to give you a better insight and idea and uh, give you more references and resources that I'll link below to papers that really help me to better understand like what's all the hype around CBD? Is it real? Is it not? Is there any science? Is there not? You know, all that. And, and let me tell you, I've been blown away. Like this could be a whole video series and we might do that to talk about this system. And I will close with links below. I make no money off this, but Ned is a show sponsor. I use their product. It enhances my sleep. I use it instead of drinking alcohol. Uh, I like their 750 milligram tincture. I do one ML under the tongue at night before bed. It's a phenomenal product. And they do have this natural skin balm that works really well also as a skin, <laughs> as a skin, that works really well also as a sex lubricant. No kidding, my wife and I have experimented with it. It doesn't sting her. It's great. Uh, it's, it's, it's like natural, like the real deal. So um, links are below to that. I hope this video gave you a little bit of an idea and better understanding into the different, you know, resources and contexts and applications for which CBD might be helpful. One thing that I forgot to mention was that in the context of cancer and appetite, CBD and, and affecting these receptors has been studied in the context of nausea and anti-vomiting. So um, that's another application. If you're having a hard time holding food down, if you're trying to put on muscle and eat a lot, maybe you could benefit from taking CBD or uh, stimulating this uh, system in, in some manner. So as always, I'm grateful that you watched all the way through. I hope you enjoyed this video. Hit that like button if you did, and we'll catch you on a future episode down the road. Appreciate you tuning in.